Spock right here, all right? That's it. Let's welcome Greg. Thanks, man. You got the mic? All right. Uh, you know, he called it the Super Bowl party earlier in the service, so we did instant replay, and you were in violation, Chris. All right, so um, yesterday, uh, there were about 130 plus that were gathered here for uh, the Parent Summit. And yeah, it was a great morning. Great morning and afternoon. Um, and uh, so yesterday's Parent Summit reminded us, uh, the theme was uh, long days and, and short years. And uh, it reminded us that um, in investing in the next generation, uh, it, requires, it requires diligence, right? It requires that we keep our eye on the ball. It requires that uh, we, we stay focused. And um, just like we read uh, earlier in Deuteronomy chapter six, that word diligent is in there, right? We teach them diligently to our children, I think the reason that's in there is because I have found that investing in the next generation is never on my timetable, is never convenient. It is never like, oh, you know what? I've set aside 20 minutes in my day for addressing parenting issues. It doesn't work that way, right? It's when the alarm goes off, when the bell rings, and you know, we're, we're called to respond in those little kind of sideways moments of life, and, and that's, when the, uh, that's, when, that's when you're called on to bring, to bring leadership. This call to diligence um, is also not just a call for parents. Um, this call to invest in the next generation is not just the responsibility of, of, of mom and dad. It is, it is a responsibility for all of us uh, to, to take seriously what, what's coming next for the generation after us. And so because we're talking about parenting and, and you say, well, I'm not, that's not, that's not me. That's not either my stage of life or, or that's not part of my reality. Uh, do not tune out because you are part of investing in this next generation. Yesterday, it was filled with parents, certainly grandparents, uh, but it was filled with uh, aunts, uncles, school teachers, children's ministry workers, youth ministry workers, people that are just taking seriously, hey, I, there's a responsibility I have in investing in the next generation. And so that's, that's for all of us. And uh, Caleb and his team that put on, uh, Caleb's our, our um, family ministries coordinator, they did a fantastic job of, of organizing uh, the day. And uh, you know there were, there were people giving out massages. What is that, hand in stone? Like they were there. It was, it was very relaxing. Um, I, I didn't get mine scheduled, so Caleb, if we could make sure I get an appointment, get my massage in. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful day. Like, they thought of a lot of details, and it was a real gift for us. But I did find when I went home, um, it, like, there's still some holes there. Like, it wasn't by, like, 10 p.m. we had implemented everything, and then the household was perfect. It didn't, it didn't quite work that way. Um, I actually was feeling a little bad for all of the kids, you know, because parents come home and, you know, they're all, you know, loaded with all of this new material that they're going to uh, implement. And so the kids are probably like, whoa, what on earth happened at that thing? But so today, as we get up and we start our day, we're, it's not, we're not finished yet. Right, the, the call on us to be, to be diligent wasn't just for Saturday afternoon and into the evening, and, and then everything's all set. Um, it's, it's a constant need for us to keep our eye on the ball, to stay, to stay focused. And so uh, what I wanna do is spend some time answering some questions that emerged out of yesterday's time so that you can get a, a little bit of a taste of, of, what, uh, of what we had. So I have some panel members. So if you guys could come up, uh, I have uh, Mark Raybold. Um, I have Caleb and Sarah Howard, and I have Ken and Eileen Hill, my parents. Um, yep, so you can uh, uh, welcome them, if you would. Welcome everybody up here. No, you can, you can, you can sit. I'm going to stand, yeah. Yep, we're good. All right, so uh, Mark, uh, Mark Raybold, uh, there on the, on the left, he has, um, uh, he's been a school teacher for a number of years, uh, currently teaching in Bridgeton, right, Mark? Um, and then uh, my parents... Uh, they, they oversee our, <laughs> our, our marriage ministry here at the church. 
um, and they raised me. So you're, um, hopefully we can keep our stories away from, <laughs> from me as much as possible. Um, and uh, Caleb and Sarah, uh, Caleb's a, a school teacher. Caleb and Sarah have invested in the next generation for years, uh, working in summer ministry uh, and in a number of different things. Uh, so uh, they're, they're the kind of people that when uh, there's a question around parenting, I, I would want to hear what they have to say. Right? There's some people that when you know, there's a question that's asked and they are giving an answer, you'd say, well, I don't really want to hear what they have to say. Uh, but this group of people, I would, I would tune into. So I'm, I'm going to um, I'm gonna invite you to listen up. And uh, so we're going to start with uh, Mark. I'm going to direct a question your way. Um, so Mark, oh, I have this on a screen. Uh, how do you teach a child to come under and respect authority who was never trained to do so? Uh, you take out a laser gun. <laughs> you know those gun gun things? They work really well. I, I want to tell you my world. I'm a middle school teacher. A lot of times a groan comes out, but not, not this. I teach in Bridgeton, and I teach middle school science like not always the favorite subject. Um, so picture the students that are coming, that are coming to my classroom. Um, we have 100% of our school is on free and reduced lunch, which is kind of the state standard for looking at poverty. Um, a lot of them are coming from very fractured families. So coming under authority when you're never trained to do so, that's a lot of my kids. A lot of those middle school kids that we like to put into a bucket and then open the bucket up in about three or four years. Um, but, but part of the authority, part of the issue with this question comes, comes to how we define authority. And if authority is, and, and I'm gonna use the analogy of me with the classroom, and then you can kind of bridge that to parenting a little bit, because right now that's my world. The, um, it's not my standing up in front of the class and saying you're gonna do it my way. It used to be, right? <laughs> Sarah was when, in my class when I was at the Cumberland Christian School, and, and I really had a distorted view of authority. It was like, this is the way you're supposed to do it. And uh, thank God I changed, I guess. <laughs> but, but now I'm looking at, at the kids and thinking, they need to understand who, how I'm under authority. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Greg gave a sermon on God being good, great, good, great, gracious, and glorious. And if you haven't heard that sermon, you need to listen to the podcast. Uh, for me, it was kind of a life changer. The, um, if you did hear the sermon and you thought, yeah, you know, it's cool, it's another sermon, you need to go back and listen to the podcast because you missed something. So when I'm standing in front of my kids, I want to demonstrate to them the person I'm under authority. So I look to, to my, my father, and my father is good. He's great, he's gracious, and he's glorious. And so I demonstrate that to the kids. I'll say, you know, I want you to be under my authority because I want to be good. I, I, I want you to understand that I have your best, mm -hmm. and that if you listen to what I have to say, I'm not doing it for my ego, I'm doing it because it's gonna benefit you. And you might not like it right now, but, mm. but in the long run, you'll see that, that uh, I'm trying to be good, like my father is good. And the one I'm under authority is, is great, and he can change circumstances. And yeah, when you're in front of a classroom of kids, um, you know, I have that grade book, and I have that stun gun. No, I don't have a stun gun. <laughs> but, but I can alter circumstances. So the kids need to know I love them. They need to know I can change things. My God is gracious. And so when I model the one that I'm under authority, and I, I try to model, you know, try to put that characteristic over to my kids, I, they need to know that they're not gonna be perfect and that I can forgive them. And so, okay, so they come into class and they're chewing gum for the upteenth time. I have to know my kids. Maybe that kid's gonna get ridden up. Maybe it's gonna be, you know what? Can you just spit it out? Or, or maybe you just turn around. You know, but they need to, they need to know that I love them they need to know that, that I can alter circumstances, that I can 
be gracious and merciful, just like my father is good, great, and gracious. And then they see who I really um, look to. I think I had emailed Greg with a sermon, said, I don't understand this glorious part. And he was really good in a response that kind of clarified it. Now I see that as the most important part. And it's like, who's really important to me? And if the kids, I teach in a public school, but every one of those kids will tell you that, that God is my king. Hmm. And, and that, that wall of separation of church and state, I've been 30 years teaching. Nobody's ever challenged it or anything like that. It's made out of paper. I don't have to preach, but I, they have to know where I'm coming from. And I now have 160 kids, and I literally can walk into a classroom that's out of control because the teacher hasn't learned how to, how to do authority. I can walk into the classroom and say, guys, what's up? I don't have to raise my voice. They know that I love them like my father loves me. They know that um, I can change circumstances and he has everything under control. They know that I'm gracious and as I've been forgiven, I'm willing to forgive them. And they know who I look to. And um, so I think if we define authority as do what I tell you to do, um, we're gonna have problems. That's but good. if we define authority as looking at the one that we're under authority, uh, I think I think that's a key. That's excellent, Mark. Thank you. Uh, in the first service, we had uh, Hillary Jones, who teaches. Um, actually, she doesn't teach. She she was a teacher at Urban Promise in Camden. Now she uh, works at the Croc Center uh, in Camden, and so she's working with uh, kids from Camden. And so she answered this question. I want to tell you what she said. Um, she said that uh, when when leading, right? So you bring your you bring your authority, um, but authority can't be the only thing that you bring. You also have to bring relationship. And so she said over time, right, over time, you don't compromise your authority, right, but over time, as you add in relationship, right, then there's a, there's a level of respect of them being willing to come under um, that consistent, loving authority. And so she said, you know, initially her authority's challenged, so what she doesn't do is just say, well, let's forget about it and then lower the standard. And what she doesn't do is, well, let me power up uh, and let me you know, be louder, be stronger, be more intense. She said, I just, I maintain my standard and then I cultivate relationship. And then uh, over time, um, the, the, there's a willingness uh, that is created to come under, come under that authority. She said it way better than I did, but it was a really good answer. All right, so uh, let me ask another question here, and I'm gonna come to Sarah uh, with this question. Uh, it's this one. All right, so Sarah, how can we foster and lead our kids in their emotions and feelings and still point them to truth without telling them uh, just stop it or grow up? I love, um, that's a great question. Yeah, I thought that was a great question. I felt compassionate reading it because um, I, I feel that in my home with my girls. Um, like, I, I feel that tension of, um, like, it's like you can't go too far in either direction. So it's kind of like, it's really easy to get busy in my day as a mom and just go through my pace really quickly and then when I go too far in that direction, then when issues come up for my girls, I'm just going so fast that I just want, I really do just want them, I want behavior management. I want them just to stop. So I just kind of want to be like, don't do that or don't feel that or just like come in line, just do the right thing. And uh, so that's like too far in this direction. And then I think I can very easily also fall in the other direction of like coddling their emotions too much where it's like there's just so much room for their emotions that there's no, there's no directiveness or there's no like, well, this is the right thing to do with your emotions and this is like what I'm teaching you about how to deal with your emotions. So um, one thing that I try to keep in mind is um, slowing my own pace down so that I know what is happening in my girls' hearts. So if they're like, uh, if like there's something coming up in terms of like resistance or defiance or di disobedience, I try to kind of figure out or leave space for myself 
to process like what's going on inside of that. Like why are they doing that? Where is it coming from? Because um, if I don't take time to process that, I will fall more in the category of like just trying to move them along into behavior management. So, um, and then normally if I know what is behind it, then um, I normally have to look outside myself for a little bit of help for how to be directive because I'm not very directive. So I normally have to ask my husband to like kind of help me um, talk to my girls about their emotions. Uh, so if you're like me, you might need some coaching along the way to know how to be a bit more directive in terms of like emotions. Because I, I mean, I think in this day and age, we really do coddle emotions a lot. And we are, I don't know. So I don't know if you have anything Good. extra add to, to add to that. Yeah. Um, yesterday, one of the pictures that I used was uh, in, in parenting for us to, us to lead well, uh, we have to balance two things. We have to balance expectations that we're bringing as well as nurture. Right, so we want to be be high in terms of expectations. Like we want, we have vision for our children, but we also want to lead them and nurture them to grow into uh, those expectations. So we don't just throw it on the table and say, "Do with it, deal with it." Uh, here's the consequences. But we want to empower them to do it. And part of nurturing them is emotions are part of who they are. Right, God has made us emotional beings. So one of the things that we need to do is teach them what is the proper place for their emotions, right? So, um, and a lot of times what, what I, I'll also teach them of, um, so like emotions are, are part of who you are, and so you express your emotions, but now's time not to express your emotions, right? Like, so, you know, you've been upset, and, and I hear you, you know, that you're sad, and I'm sorry about that, but now, now we have some things that we need to do, and we can come back and address that later on, right? But, but we we have some we got some stuff to do here, um, so we're gonna we're gonna move into that. So we we help them navigate. Okay, there are emotions. We validate the reality of their emotions, and that's how they're feeling. But emotions, it's not emotions equal actions, right? That's a that's a huge paradigm right there, right? Emotions don't equal actions. There's something that God has given us that we would call our volition, right? We exercise the will and we make decisions based on like the will and the mind are engaged and then we choose our behavior. We don't let emotions drive the train, right? They're not the engine. So all of our behaviors just flow out of our emotions. No, that is not healthy. That leads to all sorts of destruction. So we have to train our children in that as well. Yeah, you have emotions, I understand that, but there's a proper place, a proper uh, a, a way to express those emotions. Um, and so we lead them uh, in order to do that. And sometimes that means, listen, I understand that you're sad, but now's not the time for, you know, there's times where I say, you need to stop crying now. Like, this isn't that big of a deal. This, I see, it hurts, but we have other things that have to go on in our life other than, you know, you lost uh, Mr. Scrunchy Pal or whatever the, the toy may be. Um, so uh, that was uh, Jude's toy. He's 15, Mr. Scrunchy. No, I'm just kidding. That wasn't his toy. <laughs> um, all right, uh, let's move on to another question. I'm going to go to our last question here. Um, I'm sorry. I have three other questions I'm going to ask. Um, there it is. So what if, and so mom, I'm gonna ask, uh, start with you on this one. What if we are feeling stuck as parents? Like we feel overwhelmed and it seems like there are too many issues. And so then every time we step into one issue, um, it kind of creates some more issues that then we have to deal with. Um, so uh, like what, what do we do when we feel stuck like that? I felt stuck a lot of times. Uh, as a parent, we were behaviorists. Like they just had to do as we said. We didn't. Uh, we didn't really know about the heart and dealing with that. So we're really grateful that God uh, overrules and helps us in our parenting. And your kids can turn out in spite of you. So, um, but when you're feeling stuck as a parent, there's a verse that was my go-to verse in parenting, and I prayed it for my kids every day. Um, Greg probably remembers this. We would uh, often I would drive them to school. And the verse was, um, I learned it in the King James, so I'm going to have to read it because <clears throat> it, it's better in the ESV. 
If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. So wisdom is a God-given gift, and um, uh, it, com it comes from him. And so when I was stuck and I felt overwhelmed and I didn't know what to do next, I would just ask God for wisdom. And he, without reproach, means that he, he doesn't want me to worry about asking him or feel embarrassed to ask. He is willing and ready to hear my pleas and to give me the wisdom that I'm asking for. And so I think that's where I always needed to start when I felt stuck was with God's wisdom. And I, didn't, uh, I also needed to be diligent and not give up. I think sometimes when you feel stuck, you just throw in the towel and say, well, they're never going to obey, they're never going to turn out or, or whatever. Um, but Angie reminded me of this quote, um, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so I would begin again with one step and uh, try not to uh, take it out on them, but realize that a lot of the issues were my own. And in those struggles, God was revealing a lot more about me than he was about my children. That's good. And I love that. I love that he had two, a twofold purpose in our parenting, uh, to train us and to train our children. And that is a blessing. But wisdom comes from him. That's good. Good, Mama. Uh, she, um, I, I feel like you prayed that prayer about needing wisdom more often with me than with my siblings, <laughs> uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Caleb, did you have anything you wanted to add to, to that one? Sure. Um, I watched uh, uh, like a seminar by this guy named Paul Tripp um, this September, and he said something interesting about that that I, that I thought was really nice. He said every time another issue comes up, every time like there's misbehavior, every time there's like attitude, he's like, don't, don't necessarily interpret that as something negative. Um, he said every time the attitude comes up, the, all that, that's, that's a grace. That's like a nice thing because in that moment, what the Holy Spirit is doing is the Holy Spirit is highlighting a mm. place in the child's heart or the teenager's heart that he wants his light to come to. And so uh, sometimes as parents, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to focus on. We don't know like what direction to walk in. Well, the attitude, the frustration, the overwhelm, the 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 conflict, that's like the Lord saying, this is where I want my light to come. So sometimes we feel like, oh, because we feel like the ideal would be no issues. The ideal would be just like a seamless day with no problems. But our hearts aren't seamless, no problem hearts. And the Lord doesn't have desires just to like love and interact with those that are seamless and like not overwhelmed. The Lord has come to us in our darkness, in our mess, and that's how he wants to come to your children. So maybe we need to train ourselves not to think like, oh, here's an issue. Oh my, I, I don't know what to do. Paul Tripp says, why don't we just say, this is a grace. Lord, this is where you want your light to come. I don't know how to have your light come here, but I want it. Th thank you for this moment. You, you, you said something in the very beginning that like, you said that you were behaviorist and did all these different things, but then... God overruled it, or what was it? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. If you have older kids, you should be saying amen. <laughs> yeah. That's all. I mean, you don't have the pressure to get it all right. That's God's job. God's more interested in your kids than you are. And so if you mess up, welcome to the world, right? We're, we're both learning, but, but so glad that God overrules. And I, I, I wanted to punctuate that. Yeah, that's good. Sarah brought that up in the, in the first service as well. Um, just this theme of even the the cracks or the failure of her parents, uh, right? God has used that in your formation. It was hard, but God has used that in her formation for, for the good, right? Beautiful things have, have come out of those, of those ashes. And that's, and really that comes down to how, how much hope do we have in the power of the gospel, right? Can, can Jesus really bring things back from the dead? And the answer is, is yes, right? And so we, we see that. Okay, last question. Uh, I've been holding off to ask you a question, Pop. A little nervous. We'll see how, how this works. <laughs> All right, so um, this is this question. What do you do when your kids are past the age of liking to talk about, oh, yep, liking to talk about uh, heart questions? That's that little tool we have with the, like, you know, getting to the level of their heart. And so they're past that. And no matter what you ask them, they don't, they don't want to talk. 
Um, or, or what do you do when your 14-year-old doesn't even want to talk about anything uh, or doesn't even want to have a family meal with you anymore? Well, first of all, I think you need to know a little bit about me. My parenting style was a little different than some of you folks out there, and they probably didn't teach this in the seminar very well. <laughs> but when my boys misbehave, I used to tell them, you better straighten up or I'm going to rip your limbs off and beat you with the bloody stumps. <laughs> and my it's wife true. would say, that's harsh. You can't say that. So I said, all right, I'll just rip one limb off and beat you with the bloody stumps. You probably don't want to do that. It didn't really work out too good. And you can see he has all this limbs. I straightened so, up. So it, it worked. Uh, to us, as a family, mealtime was a great time to spend yeah, together. That's good. It was the opportunity for us to catch up on the day, talk about the future, and just enjoy life together. Mm-hmm. It was never an option to have meals together. I don't think I ever served your meal in your bedroom. I don't remember ever doing no, that. No, you did not. I did not. Uh, that was just a given. We ate together. We learned about each other together, and we enjoyed that time together. Now, we didn't have some of the distractions that you have today. Now, in our family, when we have a pretty large family, we uh, check our phones at the door. We don't, we don't do phones at the table. Uh, there is nothing that I know of that's that important that can't wait till after we have a good meal. And I hate to say this, but dads, that goes for you guys. Uh, you have to set the tone in the house, the mom and dad, of we're going to have conversation, we're going to enjoy each other, and that's what we're going to focus on. So that means no newspapers, no telephones, no TVs, and really no distraction. You're actually stuck having to talk to each other. And it's a great, it's a great thing to do. And you learn a lot of really neat things if you listen sometimes uh, to that. And I can say this, does it make an impact? Uh, if you were in a house in the fall of 1988, um, my wife and I got back from California, uh, taking our daughter to the master's college. And we had our meal together for breakfast, blueberry muffins every Sunday morning. <laughs> that would get you out of bed, homemade blueberry muffins every Monday morning, Sunday morning. Uh, that was a lousy meal that day. I don't think any of us could talk, could hardly pray for the meal. Uh, it made a huge impact. Take advantage of these years now. They're not going to do you any good 15 years from now. You need to do it now, starting now. Good, Pop. Thank you. Caleb, can you, uh, you chime in on this question also? Sure. Um, I just really want to affirm every time that you guys do want to talk to your kids and talk about their feelings and just unpack that. That's so good because that's our values. Those are our feelings. And you can put the word worship in there too. That's like our values, our worship, what we're like adoring. And so when you talk about that, you're able to have like influence on those things. But it's hard and it's hard to get some people to want to talk. Sometimes we as adults aren't even really good at talking about those kinds of feelings. So. Um, there, for kids growing up, there's so many things that are competing for their attention. We want to talk to them about their heart, but then there's friends and there's video games and activities and all these kinds of things. And one of the main things that we have to do as adults, um, because we do have things that we do need to pass on to the next generation, we need to carve out a space in our kids' attention so that our voice can have influence. How are we supposed to compete when there's so many other things like you know vying for their attention? So there are four things that I think that are sort of like um, high leverage practices. Like if you just have these four things just continually on your mind, it'll help us make sure that we carve enough space so that we have our kids' eyes, their attention. Number one, Fun can't be something that can only be had outside of the family or apart from mom and dad. Fun has to be something that they can have with dad, with mom, with grandpa. Um, 
does that make enough sense? So like sometimes we think fun, w whatever, like, but that's where we communicate like delight and enjoyment and appreciation and I want to be around you, I'll waste time with you, I'll spend a whole day with nothing else going on, I just like being with you, we laugh together and that'll create uh, like that attention that you'll have like a attention of your kids. Number two, it can't all be fun, 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 because that would just be like on Christmas morning, um, being like that family that buys 150 Christmas presents for the, for the kids. It's just like no matter how many of those presents they open, it doesn't really like, it sort of turns out spoiled in the end, like not so, they're not really grateful anyway. And so we can't just do fun, 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 fun. So the other rhythm that we need to have is we need to make sure that Adults are leading and kids are following. Adults are leading not just with like giving instructions and you better obey, but you know what dad says, like I, I it sort of has weight in the room. Like I sort of do it and I do it because we've had fun together and so I like this guy and he actually his values in life and what he's committed to in life, like I really respect that. It's it's almost a little bit like like, he's on an epic journey, and I want to go in his direction. So we need to have rhythms of fun, rhythms of adults leading and kids following. Number three, we need to make sure that what's on the inside, what are our feelings, what are the things that we get upset about, all this messy stuff, that it doesn't stay hidden. It doesn't stay like we can't talk about that or like I just hide that from my family. What's on the inside needs to be talked about on the outside 100%. And the last rhythm that we need to have in our family is that Jesus is not just for Sunday mornings. Jesus is not just for like devotional times. Jesus is for every moment, every thought, every challenge. Jesus is for depression. Jesus is for like every moment of every day. If our kids hear without words that Jesus is just something that I say like before we pray for a meal, but then it doesn't have anything to do with like my decisions about my finances, or my interactions with neighbors, or all those kinds of things, all of these heart talks that we're gonna have, they'll just be like not so valid in the kids' lives. So culture of fun, adults leading, kids following. What's on the inside is what you talk about on the outside, and Jesus matters for every moment of everything of every day. A uh, little bit of like correction is I didn't see a lot of pens moving or people typing that. You, you wanna get that, those four things down. Right, that, that's really good stuff. So, Caleb, can you say the four again? Because I have them written right here. But my handwriting right, is really sloppy. So number you... one is fun, culture of fun. Fun is had in the home with mom and dad. And number two, I forget it. What parents, it? parents Adults lead. Adults lead and kids follow. Three, the things that you're feeling on the inside, the things that every member of the family is feeling on the inside, that's what's talked about on the outside. And number four, Jesus Jesus is relevant for everything. Good. Caleb, you should write those down. They're, re they're really good. Get those down. So, hey, can we thank our panel? They did an excellent job. Thank you guys so much. So I have uh, just a little bit of uh, perspective that I want to bring um, as we move towards the, the end of our time. Uh, but here's, uh, here's kind of the... The reality is that, um, I don't know how to get this. There we go. Uh, the reality is this. We have to spend some time asking questions because we're imperfect, right? We, we need things like parent summits and conversations with other parents to, to figure out how to navigate this stuff. School teachers need to talk to other teachers. Coaches need, need counsel from other coaches and we need that because, because we're imperfect. So we fail in our imperfection in leading well the next generation, right? You, you, you know that, right? Like you, you fail in your leadership role and you and I do that, we do that often. And, and here's what happens when we come face to face with our imperfection, when we come face to face with our failure, that's not such a good feeling, right? That's not a, that's not a, um, you know, that's not a, that's not a good time when you, when you come and you get confronted, you know, with your, with your own, with your own brokenness. And with that comes a lot of, a lot of emotions, a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of negative, uh, uh, 
a lot of negative thoughts and negative feelings. And so maybe you can, you can relate to this. Do you, do you feel shame? Do you feel guilt? When you hear stories, do you, do you, think, do you, do you think back with remorse or maybe looking to your future, you feel hopeless, frustrated. Maybe it literally pains you um, to consider uh, your weakness, your immaturity. You think back to those, those outbursts of anger or the times when, when someone that you were leading, someone that you were in relationship with and they were at a time of vulnerability and you were silent and you didn't show up at the time that they needed you. Maybe it was your tone of voice was harsh or dismissive, or maybe your physical demeanor, right? Like you brought, you brought power. Maybe you brought violence. And so a lot of times when we consider um, what did we do in investing the, in the next generation, a lot of times that, that's a negative thought for us. We, we, we start to feel the, the weight of shame. And so in light of that reality, I wanna give you a word this morning. I wanna, I wanna give you a word that, uh, that, that I think biblically speaks to that place of, uh, of identified brokenness, and that word is mercy. We've, we've got to understand mercy. We gotta understand what, what is its role in our life and, and how much do we need mercy. Uh, often we, we confuse the word mercy with the word grace. So I wanna, I wanna clarify, and they are connected and they're, they're similar, um, but there's a difference and it's, and it's an important difference. This is, my functional, this, is, uh, this is my functional definition. So grace is receiving what you do not deserve. Right, grace is being given something that that you didn't earn. It's just it's just grace. It was just it was just given to you. Right, and and there's been stories about just gracious acts within our church where people like give things to other people. Like over this year, you know, we we brought up the the Garcias and some needs that they have. Somebody just gave them a car, just just grace. They didn't earn it, right? It wasn't part of their compensation. It was just, it was just, it was just a gift that was given. That's, that's grace. They didn't deserve it. Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. There is something that is due to you, and it's not given to you. I remember pretty clearly, uh, it was like early 2000s, I think it was probably like 2003. I'm thinking it was around there. And I was um, part-time here at the church, but I was driving a truck full-time. And I was on my way to Delaware uh, to go to the Delaware Memorial Bridge. I had to go across that bridge uh, to get there. And so I took this road uh, we call the Old Fisherman's Trail. Uh, and so I was coming into Swedesboro. And so the speed limit you know, slowed down pretty quickly. And I was just zipping along. Uh, and you know the I got that sinking feeling when I saw those blue lights flashing behind me, and so I pull over and I knew I was just I was speeding, and so the the cop comes up and you know the, it was it was a stressful time of life had two young kids Jude was little Isabella was born, had two young kids I'm working a couple jobs don't have I don't have money to spend on uh, a ticket to pay a fine or to. Uh, have my insurance raised, you know what that's like. And so, uh, so the guy comes up and, and uh, he says, you know, do you know why I pulled you over? You know, what, whatever the standard line is. I'm like, yeah, I, I was speeding and man, it's a really hard time right now. And so I start kind of explaining some of my life circumstances. And I'm like, honestly, can you just give me a break? Like, I, I know I deserve a ticket. I know I was speeding. I just, could you just, could you cut me some slack? I don't think I used the word mercy, but that's what was going through my mind. And the guy let me off. I didn't get a ticket. He's like, I just want you to slow it down. And I don't think I hugged him, but I, I, I wanted to. <laughs> and, but that was mercy, right? Like I deserved a ticket. I was speeding. There's standards. There's fines that are appropriate to that. And I'm driving a big truck too fast. And so I deserved something, but I didn't receive it. 
That was mercy. He showed me, showed me mercy that day. When we think about the cross, the cross is both grace and it's mercy. The cross gives us what we, what we could never earn and what we could never deserve, right? It gives us God. It gives us a relationship with God. It gives us the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us. It gives us the promise of an inheritance that is ours, that one day we will be home with the Father. We never earn that. That's grace. God just says, I give you myself. But the cross is also mercy because there was a punishment, there was a penalty, and instead of that penalty coming towards us, it was diverted away from us and on to Jesus as our substitute. So God punished him instead of punishing us. So he extended to us mercy. Mercy is not receiving what I do, what I do deserve. So that's why I wanted to talk about mercy today. Because I think when we identify those points of failure related to investing in the next generation, when we have those points of regret, we're not just talking about being immature. We're not just talking about being weak. We're actually talking about sin. We are talking about in those moments that, that you are feeling shame most of the time, that's because you were treasuring something other than God. It's because your love was disordered. So anger came out. You were driven more by your comfort. You were driven more by the, the idolatry of, of, of your ease than you were by the voice of God or the spirit of God leading you. That, that's not immaturity, that's sin. That's not just like, you know, making a mistake. That's, that's sin, that is rejecting, that is rejecting God. So our parenting problems aren't really parenting problems. They're, they're worship problems. They're, they're sin problems. And so when, when we're dealing with an issue of sin, we've got we've to say, well, what does God do to address sin? And the answer is mercy. He gives out, he gives out mercy. So what I need to do in being confronted with my sin problem, what I need to do is get before God and say, God, be, be merciful to me. God, I, I need you to forgive me. I have sinned against you. I've sinned against that, that child. They didn't deserve what I did. God, I, I need your forgiveness. I need you to extend to me mercy. So what do you think God thinks about that? And God loves it. He loves when we come to this understanding of our need for mercy. Look at, I'm gonna give you a couple passages here. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Like Jesus understands what we go through. He understands our vulnerability. But we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So therefore, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's an invitation for us to go to Jesus. He understands we're frail. He understands we're broken. We can go to him boldly because he's one that dispenses mercy. He gives out mercy. Isaiah 30, 18, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. He exalts himself to show mercy to you. As God gives out mercy, it is his joy, it is his delight. And so when you see God dispensing this mercy, there's a demonstration of how great, how powerful, how majestic he is, that he would be willing to give so graciously and so generously that he would dispense mercy. I love this one, Ephesians 2, 4. But God being rich in mercy, listen, you're not gonna, he's not gonna um, you know, come to the end of his mercy account and be like, sorry, I don't have any more to dispense to you. He is rich 
in his mercy because his love is boundless towards us. So here's the good news. When you come to the point of realizing that you're in need of mercy, a lot of times we think of that, that's our place of greatest failure, right? That's the, that's the bottom. But also that's the turning point for you to move forward. And so I want us to start thinking of mercy, not simply as bad news, but mercy as a, as a victory cry. Like, like I, I'm finally getting it. I need God. I'm finally understanding it. I, what I need is, is mercy. So think for a moment. Just reflect on, on, on how much you need the mercy of God in your life. Like how much do you blow it how much do you do you respond out of anger or spite or bitterness or jealousy how much are the thoughts and inclinations of your heart to love things that are less than god i mean if we like you know if that got tallied and we carried that tally around like we would be like we would be we wouldn't show our face in public because we'd be so embarrassed of because sin isn't just an external thing it's an internal thing how much do, how often do you think like inappropriate thoughts about another person or angry thoughts towards another person. It's shameful. But at each one of those points of sin or failure, what do we need? We need mercy. So consider how much, how much mercy is required of God to love you. Or you can ask this question. How much mercy is required of your spouse or your friends in order to love you? Or how much mercy is required on behalf of your parents to raise you? Right? Like you are surrounded by mercy. For you to be here is an expression of the mercy of God. So we are people in need of mercy. So when we cry out for mercy, we're asking God to give us the very thing that he's calling us to give out to the next generation. When you tap into mercy, you tap into the resources that are needed for you to be diligent in parenting for the, for the, long, day, uh, for the long days and the short years. Right? That, that's, what, that's what God is, is offering you. What you need to give out in those moments is mercy. So I say mercy is a victory cry because it means that rescue is on its way. And also rescue is then, or mercy is what you can then dispense. It's what you can offer. It's given to you so it can be given through you. So as a parent, as a parent, we're like first responders in crisis, right, for our, for our children. You, you realize like, again, first responders, right, that's when, whenever the alarm goes off, whenever the call comes in, it's not, oh, you know, I, I set aside, you know, 20 minutes at 11 for first response calls. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's whenever, whenever the crisis happens. So as parents, whenever the crisis happens, we're the first responders. It's never at our convenience. But our first response does not need to be our first response when we show up on the scene like Mark was talking about as the face of authority what is the character of that face what does it look like and is our first response to lecture to judge to condemn no our first response because what has been given to us is mercy our first response can be I step in and I offer mercy First responders don't take personally, at least I don't think they do. Some of you first responders can correct me later. Don't correct me now because it'll ruin my point, but you can correct me later. First responders don't take the needs of, uh, the, the needs of others personally. They don't get mad that, that, there's a, there's that, that their, their day's been interrupted and, and this crisis has happened and then they punish the person when they show up. Like First responders are there to rescue and so how do we rescue? We don't rescue by showing up in crisis and chuck in the law, right? We, we show up in crisis and, we, and we, offer, we offer mercy. Here's what mercy means. Is that when we show up, we don't show up with threats. We don't show up and offer shame. 
what we do is we, is we show up and we offer mercy. Our actions, our reactions are tempered by this call to, to nurture, to be tender, to be understanding, to be compassionate, to be loving. Now, that doesn't mean you don't bring appropriate consequences, but the way in which you bring those consequences don't need to carry with it the edge of your furious disappointment. It can come with compassion and mercy to lead them. We don't have to punish them with our, with our disposition. Paul Tripp said this, no parent gives mercy better than one who is convicted that he, he desperately needs it himself. So start thinking, if you wanna be one that dispenses mercy, start considering how much mercy is required for the father to love you. Start thinking, how, how much do I need mercy? And as we meditate on that, then what's going to come out of us is this, abundant of, this abundance of mercy that we have to give that's been shown to us. So parents, be patiently committed to this process. Dispensing mercy isn't gonna change things overnight. Dispensing mercy is in all the crises, in all the issues that come up, to step in to, and remind yourself that you're a recipient of mercy. You're on a mission of mercy. You've been sent by God, and it's an extended process. So you'll do it today, and you're gonna do it tomorrow, and then you're gonna have to do it late tomorrow night, and then early the next day in the morning. And you know, even th this week for me, uh, we had the parent summit, very busy week. I had to go back to my son. I had to kind of track him down and say, I, I'm sorry. I, I was so wrong. I, I treated you. It was, I wasn't wrong in what I said, but in my tone of voice, I was harsh. And I need you to forgive me. And, like I, and I, that was so important to have that conversation. That's not a proud moment for me. I'm not celebrating that I was harsh with my son, but but I'm a recipient of mercy. So then when I realize what I'm dispensing is not mercy, then I have to go back and I have to, I have to admit that I wasn't patiently committed to this process. Here's a quote by uh, Paul Tripp. This comes out of his book, Parenting. It's an excellent, excellent resource. This is his last chapter in it. And he says this, willingly confess your faults it is vital to remember that it's not just your children who are in that long process of change. You are too. You're not yet all that God's grace has the power to help you to be. You have not graduated from your daily need of God's rescue and forgiveness. Because of this, you think um, you will think bad things. You will desire wrong things. You will give way to frustration, impatience, and anger. There will be moments when you lose your way. You will have a bad day. You will fall into saying and doing things more out of anger than out of grace. Good parenting is not just about being a good example. It's also about humbly confessing when you haven't. If you've blown it, don't activate your inner lawyer and defendant and justify yourself, but rather cry out for mercy. So uh, kind of the worship team come up. In a couple minutes, Pastor Chris will, will come up and uh, kind of lead us in a time of prayer. But here's what I want you to be thinking about is really two things. Uh, how, how aware are you of your need for mercy? Right? How, how clear is that for you? And then, uh, I, we didn't do this in the, in the other service, but I also wonder if today, one of the things that you're gonna need to do is move towards someone and have that conversation. You know what, I, I, I was wrong. I, I, I sinned against you and I'm, I'm in need of forgiveness. Um, maybe that's your child, maybe that's, Maybe that's a friend of yours. Maybe that's someone in the next generation that, that you just need to own that you were not merciful. I, I, I've been a recipient of mercy and what I showed you was not mercy and, and, I'm, and I'm sorry. So I want you to take these moments as, as the worship team leads, you're welcome to sing along, but I want you to think, I want you to be attentive to 
How aware are you of your need for mercy? And are there people uh, that you need to have a conversation with where you need to walk humbly before them and confess to them uh, the ways in which you've sinned against them? Thank you.